Well, good, good afternoon and welcome to the Jupyter Widgets tutorial. If you're not here for the Jupyter Widgets tutorial, we won't be offended if you go out either door. Um, I've, my name is Matt Craig. I teach physics and astronomy at Minnesota State University Moorhead, a small university in northwest Minnesota. Uh, my involvement in Python is primarily through the AstroPy package and then I've, my first SciPy five years ago, I think I went to what was the first tutorial on IPython notebooks and got introduced to widgets and have been hooked since. Uh, got two other presenters who are here today, Jason Grout and Martin Brettles. And the way we have things set up, we'll, we've each got a block of the, of the tutorial that we'll run through. Um, before I forget, we should have a break around 2.30. But if it gets to 2.30, 2.40, and we haven't had a break yet, somebody should raise their hand and interrupt us. The food's only out from 2.30 to 4, and I don't want to miss the food. So, um, we, If you run into, we, we've got some post-its coming around. They're in the back of the room now. Soon you'll have a blue, bluish post-it and an orange post-it. If you have a problem during the tutorial, stick the orange post-it up on your computer or raise your hand. Um, there'll be a couple times when we're working on exercises that we ask you to put up the blue post-it when you're done so we know how far along people are. Okay, so let's get started. Well, before I go any further, does everybody have the notebooks open? Okay. So I'll be running the, the tutorial in, in JupyterLab. Most of the, the widgets interface works just fine in JupyterLab. There will be a couple of things that I'll point out when we get to them that aren't working in JupyterLab yet, but they're fairly minor. All of it works in the classic notebook. So the idea of widgets is to um, make it easier for you to interact with your data. So a you know standard use of a terminal might look something like this. You want to know what nine times nine, nine times blah, nine times nine is, you enter it, um, you get a result. Uh, you want to do this for several different numbers maybe, so you write a function, um, and then to test the function, you pass it a value and see if you get the result that you expect. Widgets give you a way fairly easily of taking a function you've already written, so we didn't modify our function f, right? It's just a straightforward Python function. Um, give the interact function from um, IPy widgets a little bit of information about what values we want the argument to have, and then it wires up a GUI so that as you change the slider, the value of x is updated, that's passed into the function, and the result is printed out on in the browser. Um, interact behind the scenes is generating some um, widgets for you. And what we're going to spend a fair bit of time in this first 45 minutes of the tutorial is going through the base widgets that are included in IPy widgets, the building blocks from which you can build something more interesting. Um, the so one type of widget is a float slider widget. We'll see there's several different varieties on this. For any of these widgets, you can have more than one instance of it running in the browser window. and they are two different views onto the same underlying model. So if I move one of the sliders, the other one moves. You can get the values of widgets from the Python side, and you can set the value of a widget from the Python side. So one of the things that excited me about widgets initially, um, my very first sort of public example of programming was in middle school in the mid-1980s. Um, and I told the librarian, sure, I'll write you a video game for the TRS-80. Um, you know, in those days, you, you made things on the screen by poking values into memory. Um, and uh, the, the big display of the, the, the game ended up being a bunch of people watching me mutter under my breath as I typed at a keyboard and desperately wish I'd never said yes. Um, <laughs> And so when I saw the when I saw widgets and I was like, wait, you mean I can just write Python and I can make GUI elements? I got just absurdly excited that I could do all of this without having to learn any JavaScript or anything complicated. Um, so uh, you can customize these, customize what happens when you do something with a, a widget. So um, you can define a function that the widget observes. Um, 
So here I've written a function handle change that when it gets a change event from the widget, um, updates the value of a variable. We're gonna be coming back to each of these pieces in a, in a little bit. So we'll go into more detail then. Um, let's see, so right now the slider value is set to eight, so I should get 64 when I square, and I do. If I go back up, adjust the slider, Square's been updated. Um, finally, you can link widgets together. So um, I've, I've got two widgets now, the uh, a text widget down here and the slider, and I've linked the two of them together so that when I change one, the other changes. And it works in both directions. Ah, right. So there's a limit when we decide, when we define this slider, it went from minimum five to maximum of 10. So when I try setting a value of 15, the slider stops at 10. So as a, I'm gonna go to the next notebook now and you can either follow along with these um, from this index page or um, if you look in a files view, we've named all of the files so that they should be presented in the order we're going to go through them. So I, I did a version of this tutorial about five, five and a half weeks ago at my institution. There's a faculty member there who teaches astronomy um, and a couple of students and they, uh, in our department, in our intro astronomy classes, there are a lot of flash-based interactives that we used, that we used. Flash is going away and we wanted to replace those. And so, um, to, to sort of motivation and, and to set the, the scale for where we expect you to be in five weeks. Um, the, and because it's a nice illustration of what you can do with widgets, even though each of the indiv individual pieces is fairly simple. Um, this is a single widget that combines several pieces to it. So there's a three-dimensional view of a binary star system in the upper left corner using the package pi3.js. Um, a plot that changes, um, I'll, I'll show you an animated version of this in a moment. As the stars orbit around each other, the plot gets updated. And um, using the graph as they're using the plot, uh, sorry, using the package BQ plot. Um, and all of the controls you see down towards the bottom are, let me get this up into full screen are from playing iPy widgets. So one of the things that's included in iPy widgets is a play widget. Um, the way we have this set up is you adjust the, what's called the inclination, the angle of the orbit. You get different views of the binary star system and the light curve is updated in the upper right. As you, as you move the star, you can change properties of the stars. We've set things up so that the display doesn't update until you let go of the control, so you have some flexibility in how often your, your um, model gets in or, or updated. And, okay, now can I find the right? There we go. Right, so I, I wanted to include this because it, what, what surprised me a little bit was that um, the goal for the summer for the folks I did this with was to write three or four interactives. This binary star simulator was on there as a, well, if we get to the end of the summer and we have some time, we'll put this together. But they got through everything's. Okay, we missed the, we missed the, the electrical socket. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was watching. It's like, okay, now they, hmm. I get so excited about widgets and I just can't, I can't control myself. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, what I'm looking forward to is, is seeing what you guys do with this in a month or two months. So, want to spend five, 10 minutes here um, showing you first about a, a tool called Interact that lets you um, construct and display a widget interface without having to, do, to write any low level widget code yourself. Um, so if you could get to this notebook, 
Thanks. Some more. And let's see. So let's go through um, the imports here. So interact is a function that's part of IPy widgets. Thank you. Yeah, probably. I guess I maybe should have just asked for a straw. Um, so interact lets you take a function that you've written, and if you give it some hints about what type of variable um, the argument is, then it will generate for you a widget, and by default, it prints out the return value of the function. So you pass in as the first argument to interact the function that you want it to um, generate the UI for. Um, if you say something about what the argument is by setting a default value, then it will use that to guess what kind of widget you want. So in this case, it's on integer as the argument, guessed you wanted an integer slider to go along with that. If we'd said X was a Boolean, it would generate a checkbox. Um, if X was a string, then it would generate a text field. Right, that updates in real time. Um, you can also use interact as a decorator. So uh, the syntax is exactly the same as before in that the controls are generated by the default values that you pass in. In this case, we've passed in a floating point number, so we get a floating point slider out of it. It is possible to um, set specific values and, and keep those values fixed as you're modifying uh, the other arguments to the function by adding a fixed keyword. So now as we change P as the first argument, Q is the second argument, as we change the value of P, that updates in the display, but the value of Q is kept fixed at 20. Um, my PhD work was in cosmology, so when I see these, it, the first thing I think was, okay, so if we're gonna set the Hubble constant, the expansion rate of the universe, and see what happens if we change the density of the universe, this is perfect for that case. Um, what we've seen so far is, have, have essentially been abbreviations for widgets. Um, you could, if you wanted to, instead of saying, uh, interact f and then just saying x equals 10, which is what we've done before, you could pass in what IPy widgets behind the scenes substituted for that integer slider. So you could set the min value and the maximum value in the step. We'll see a, a, a easier syntax for doing that in a moment. Um, uh, like we said a couple minutes ago, the type of the keyword argument is what de determines the type of um, GUI element that's generated. So I, I actually find myself using interact not infrequently in the classroom, or what I want to be able to do is show a graph of something and demonstrate how the graph responds if I change something. And I don't start out with at, at the base level making a box widget and then a graph and then a slider widget and putting all those together. I write the function and I use interact. So in a couple minutes, we'll, we'll see some graph examples using interact too. Questions at this point? Yes. So the question was, if you have something like Interact that you're using in a script that runs in a, in a notebook, is there a, uh, something you can do so that the user will get a warning if they try, try running it outside of a notebook? Um, if, if the import, if iPad widgets doesn't exist, then you'll get an error on the import for iPad widgets. Is, is that sufficient, or are you saying if you're not connected to a front end? So if you uh, use the same Python, Yeah, you'll, 
probably get an error when you try to open a comp. It, it'll try to make a connection to the front end, okay. and and it'll probably give you an error. So I'm not sure. Cases where it just shows like someone returns an object, but nothing shows up, and it's like, oh. Yeah, let's look at it and see. So for, for the recording, the answer to the question was if um, iPad widgets is not installed, an error will get raised at that point if you try to import it. Um, we're, we think that there should be an error thrown if you, at the stage where the widget tries to send a message to the kernel and the kernel doesn't exist. Um, in practice, I haven't run into that too much because the most of the widget you know, most of this kind of stuff I'm doing in a notebook, and so I can't run the notebook from the command line. Um, other questions? Okay, so, uh, right, if all you want to do is change the minimum and maximum values of a slider, it would be a pain to have to type out insider, yada, yada, yada. And so there are shortcuts for that. If you give two values, those are used as the min and the max. If you give three, it's min, max, and step. And if you want to give a min, max, and a step, and also specify the default value, or the starting value, then uh, you can do that using the decorator this way. So in the decorator, you're saying what you want the bounds of the slider to be in the step, and then in the function definition, you're providing the default value. You can also do drop down widgets this way. Um, and you can set up drop down widgets so that there's a difference between the value that's displayed in the drop down and the value that's sent back to Python. So in this case, if you select one, the number 10 is being sent to our function f. What that function did was multiply by three, so we get 30 out. If you change it to two, we get 60. Okay, so interactive is similar to interact, but returns a widget. So we haven't displayed it quite yet. We'll get there in a moment. So what we got back from W is a um, widget. It turns out that when you have something with several pieces to it, and in what we've seen so far, there have really been two or three widgets involved. So if I back up to this drop down, there are at least three widgets here. There's the drop down itself. There's a widget that holds the output from the function, and both of those are put together inside of a box. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah, I switched when I did the YouTube video and forgot to switch back. How's that? Okay, great. Right, so if we look at the children, we can see what the children are. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, wait, we haven't displayed this one yet. Um, to display the widget, you can do one of two things. You can display or just type w by itself as the last thing in the, um, in the cell. And so this widget, right, the top one top or first child is an integer slider that goes from minus 10 to 30. Uh, second one, integer slider that goes from minus 20 to 60. The difference is that now we have an object that is this widget. So we can get the values of the, um, of the keyword arguments out of the widget. We can get the result of the um, function out of the widget. And so what interactive gives you over interact is a widget that you could, if you wanted to, take an embed in some other widget. So if I wanted to do, back to my expansion of the universe example, if I wanted to have two tabs, one that showed them a Hubble constant of expansion rate of the universe of 50 and one that said 100, I could generate two um, interactive plots with two different values of, the, of this Hubble constant. Uh, using interactive, save those two widgets and put them into a tab widget. You could also reach in and modify things if you wanted to. Right, that's the other advantage. Is now, once you have this, you can go in and change things. So if I draw 
wanted to change the minimum value of the first child, which is an integer slider, to 10. Whoops. Oh, yeah, yeah, I have a typing expansion program on, and W is with. Thanks. Now the moment of truth. Yes. So you can, right, so that is the other advantage. You can modify the widget once you have it. Uh, so let's do a, a, a quick interactive plot. So um, we're writing a function uh, that plots a straight line using matplotlib. So it's using the normal matplotlib commands you're, you're familiar with, if that's the package you use for graphing. And to make the plot interactive, we just feed it into, as a function, in, into interactive. This would work with interact also. And we get out a graph where you can adjust the slope, adjust the intercept, and watch it change in real time. Is anybody, as, as you adjust these sliders in, on your computer, are any of you seeing some lag between when you move the slider and when? Yeah, so that, that's one difference I've noticed between Jupyter Lab and the classic notebook, is in the classic notebook, the updates take a really long time. Um, in Jupyter Lab, they don't. Um, if you make the function more complicated, or, or the better way to say it, the more complicated the function is, the longer it's going to take to update. So even if it, in Jupyter Lab, if I drop in a complicated enough function, I'll see an almost comical amount of lag sometimes as I adjust the slider and then get five minutes of watching it update. Yep. Thank you for mentioning that. So it is possible to set up the widget so that instead of uh, the widget updating continuously, so what's happening up here is that as I drag this, every time the value of the slope of the line changes, a message is sent to my function, my function updates the plot. What you can do instead is um, disable those continuous updates, and there's two ways of doing that. Um, so for this demonstration, we've got a function that doesn't do a whole lot except sleep. <laughs> Which, on a warm Texas day after a nice big clay pit lunch is mighty appealing. But, um, so if you use interact manual instead of interact, then you get the usual user interface events. So in this case, we had one argument that we're setting to a float slider. Uh, nothing gets run until you push the run interact button. So in interactive, you can do the same thing. The details of how you do it are a little bit different. You pass in a dictionary as a second argument and say that uh, manual is true. The other way of handling this is um, to use a special keyword on the float slider widget. Um, you can set continuous update to false, and the way this works is that I can move the widget around all I want, um, a event won't trigger and call my function until I let go. Um, personally, I, I prefer this to the run interact thing because I forget to push run interact. Um, um, but in the binary star simulator, for example, that I showed you a couple minutes ago, um, continuous update is set to false because it takes some time to recalculate each of the models, and so you wait till the user is, has set the parameters they want, and then then it goes. Sometimes you might have like five controls that you want to set in conjunction with each other, and then having the button is nice. Yeah. You adjust all five controls and then press the button to go. Yep, that's a good point. Okay, so small exercise here. Um, what I want you to do is we want to modify this plotting widget so that the um, values only update when you release the mouse. Uh, 
So it's maybe going to be easier as a first step here if we add a cell above and then display right here. So take a couple minutes. Um, I've got the line of code here already that, that sets continuous update for the first child, the slope slider here, um, to false. So please go ahead and make the second slider behave the same way. There's not a lot that you're intended to type in here. And once you're done with it, if you could stick your blue-green post-it onto your computer, and if you don't have a blue-green post-it, raise your hand. So if you've got a question while you're working, just raise your hand or check with somebody near you. Sure. And when you've got it working, stick your green post it onto your computer. So the fix here is the, if we look back up at the widget, uh, first child is the slope, second child is the y-intercept. And so if we want to set the check in, second child's continuous update to false, we just need to change the index of into children. And then it should only update when you release the sliders. Yep. Yes, you can. And there is a, I don't, has it been released? Has IPy MPL been released yet? Um, when you see, see multiple plots, basically one plot and then appending a second. Where it just doesn't clear the plot, it says you generate some of the slides. Jason, do you know if Interact can do that? Can you say clear output is false? Interact. So that if you do uh, like plot, append the. Uh, but is it that you want the plots to append, or you just want to keep writing on top of the same plot? Okay. Oh, good question. So the question was, so suppose we save this notebook, we push it up to GitHub, is it going to be interactive on GitHub? No. <laughs> Do you want to come up and? Yeah. So, uh, so it does render on MB Viewer, uh, but GitHub doesn't do it because of security issues. 
So uh, I don't see that uh, changing uh, uh, soon. Um, and be convert, does that work? Sorry, what was the question? So uh, to, uh, to render, so if you save this notebook, uh, will it render on GitHub? No, security issues. It does render on uh, MB Viewer, right? Um, yeah, I use that actually, yeah, it does. But it's not so interactive on MB It's interactive in the sense that the, uh, if it's only front-end interaction, uh, but if you need some Python to execute, then it, that part doesn't work. You would need to use, uh, say, uh, my binder or something. Yeah, so towards the end, we'll come back to how do you present widgets to users. Um, some users are okay with download the repo and go to the command lines. Some aren't. So, other questions? Yep. I don't, so the question was, does it work with Dask? I don't, yeah, I don't know why it wouldn't. Question? Yep. So if I, uh, for example, interactive block, if mm -hmm. in the next cell I just type interactive block again, I get the same blocks and they are the same. Does this use more resources or is it just like a view? I, I mean, it, it, so, so you use more resources in the sense that yes, in JavaScript there is a new view created, but the amount of, but essentially no, and the amount of use resources we're using anyway for these widgets compared to what you would see if you went to a YouTube page is fairly small, so. Other questions? Okay, let's go to the next notebook. Uh, we've already seen at least roughly what widgets are and what they can be used for. There's a couple new things that we want to show you in here. Um, so let's do the import. Uh, so there's two ways to display a widget. One is um, to take advantage of the fact that the way that notebooks work is that the representation of whatever the last line of code is in a code cell is displayed in the cell below if that object has a, a uh, particular method defined for, for uh, a representation in the notebook. And so one way to show a widget is just to have it the last thing in the notebook, like typing in interactive plot. Um, there is a command display that lets you it's a little bit more flexible about where in the cell you, you make the display happen. Um, we've already seen that if you display the same widget more than one time, you're making more than one view of it. Um, on the, the reason this works is that on the Python side, there's one widget object that you created when you define the widget. On the um, JavaScript side, there's a model of that widget that's created, and then you can have as many views of that model as you want to in the notebook. You can close a widget by using close. Um, and if we remake, remake the widget, again, we can get and set values. The useful thing to know about is that each widget has a bunch of keys defined, and the keys are the things that you can pass back and forth from the front end JavaScript to Python. Um, the keys that are available depend on the type of the widget, but you can always get that list by looking at the keys property. So this is a slider. So there's a continuous update property we've already talked about, a description we'll come back to in a minute. Um, disable does what you think it would do. If you said disabled equals true, then you can't interact with the slider. Um, we'll be talking quite a bit about layout in a little bit, max and min we've already seen. Um, and so because I don't have the widgets documentation open in front of me at all times. Um, it's not infrequent. In, I, I use this feature not infrequently to remind myself what can I do with this widget. It is possible to add things to this so uh, without having to do any JavaScript side coding. So if you want to add other traits that widgets have that can be synced across widgets, it is possible to do that without too much trouble. Um. <laughs> 
Right, so you can set values to some of those properties when you create the widget. Um, in this case, we're setting the value and whether or not it's disabled, so I can't type. As with the, oh wait, let me modify this a little bit. Okay, I can change whether control is disabled programmatically. Another cell, now I can edit. Change it back. Uh, you can link two widgets together. So here we've got a float text and a slider widget, and there's a function, two functions for linking, one called link and one called JS link. Um, JS link makes a link happen on the client side in the JavaScript. So if you were to upload uh, this notebook to GitHub and then look at it in NB Viewer, it would render the widgets, and as you dragged one widget you'd, down here, you'd see the text box update. Or if you change the text box, you'll see the slider update. Um, in a couple of minutes, well, probably after the break, we'll come back to um, um, just plain link, which does the link in the Python side. And then unless you're connected to a computer that's running Python in the background, the links aren't going to work. And you can also unlink them programmatically. Questions? Okay, so next notebook up is a list of a bunch of widgets. Um, although I could read all of this to you, it would get a little painful. So what I'd suggest we do instead is take your green sticky off if you have your green sticky. Um, take the next five or 10 minutes, um, run through the notebook here, execute each of the cells, see what the different, um, widget types look like. There will be a couple places where I want to say something, but um, take five, 10 minutes, run through the cells. Let us know when you have questions. Also, if you're having any installation issues, if things aren't working for you, please raise your hand so we can get that solved now. So if you've made it all the way through this notebook and you're ready to move on, slap on the green sticky. Um, there's a couple things I want to point out. Uh, you can see in this notebook what gets um, displayed if you have run a notebook, you've made widgets, you save the notebook, you close down the kernel, a day later you open the notebook back up. You don't, uh, at least by default, see the widgets. You see a text, short text saying there was a widget here, essentially. Um, Let me go through here. So there are a variety of sliders. We got a question during the working time. Where was it? Okay, it's coming up. Ah, okay, here's a good example. Well, maybe it's, it's, it's not the best. So notice this, this um, label on the slider is cut off. I'm in Texas, so... Um, the, uh, by default, out of the box, each of the labels has a fixed width. We'll come back in a, in a couple notebooks to how you change that. Um, the advantage of it, if you're using short labels, is that automatically all the labels are are aligned and all the controls are aligned. But it is it is changeable. Okay, where are we at? Maybe, oh, so let me say just something about the the text widgets because there are four of them. So um, the text and text area are intended to be input areas. Um, the text for, for short text, the text area for longer text, um, 
Labels are intended to be short pieces of text that you're going to put next to some sort of control. If you have paragraphs and paragraphs of text, we'd recommend to use the HTML or HTML math um, for rendering those. Buttons and okay, so output we're going to talk about a fair bit. So, questions about any of the widgets leading up to output? Yep. Can you use an image with a button? Question was, can you use an image with a button? I think the answer is no, you cannot decorate a button with an image. If we have some time at the end, I wrote this little package that may be a very bad idea called IPI events that would let you <laughs> would let you make a image clickable. You, yeah. you can add an icon to a button. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but so so part of the answer here is you, if you know any JavaScript, then you can do anything, whether or not it's advisable. Um, <laughs> Like I said, there is a there is a package called IPI events that lets you attach events to widgets. Um, that can be a really slow way to process browser events, so so depending on what you need, it might work. But uh, so uh, other questions before we get to the output widget. Can you demonstrate again how you extend the text field label? Sure. So. There's, let me find that. Yeah, we'll talk a lot more about the layout and how to change the layout. There we go. So quick answer to your question. If we change, if we set the style to this, then we're seeing the full string now. Um, the downside is that the space for the label has come at the expense of the space for the slider. When we get to the styling notebook, we'll talk about how to break those two apart and give the label its own widget, the slider its own widget, and put them next to each other. Other questions? Okay, so uh, what the output widget does is let you capture the out output that would normally go to the notebook. Um, so unlike some other widgets, when you first display an out output widget, there is nothing in the browser. Um, if I execute this um, set of print statements, instead of going to the cell underneath, it goes to the Output widget, anything that you can display in a Jupyter Notebook can be displayed inside of the output widget. So if you get, if this tutorial is moving a little bit too slowly, you can start playing last year's tutorials and bump it up to double speed with YouTube. And um, <laughs> there are some changes coming up though, so don't go too far ahead. Um, let's see, we'll come back and talk more about the Output widget in a moment. The animation, the play widget, uh, it essentially provides a loop for you, looping over integers that you can then feed into another widget. So in this case, we're using the play widget to drive a slider. Uh, controller is not working, right? Right, okay. So in principle, you can you can link to a game controller also. Um, in practice, don't try that over Bluetooth at the last minute. Um, um, a couple widgets which will be handy later once we start writing our own custom widgets are the box, hbox, and vbox, each of which is intended to be a container that holds other widgets. Um, hbox is, is by default lays things out horizontally, vbox lays them out vertically. So in this case, we've got two V boxes, one with 
zero and one, one with two and three, and then we've put those two feed boxes into an H box. There's an accordion widget. So inside of this, you can put any other widgets you want to. And a tab widget, which again can have, whoops, widgets inside of it, and you can put them inside of each other even if you want to. You can control programmatically which tab is selected. So if I change this to zero, I get the zero tab. Um, with the accordion, you can set it to none selected if you want everything to start out closed. You can nest them. Uh, this particular example doesn't do a whole lot except show that you can have accordions inside of tabs, and I think in principle you can do tabs inside of, uh, inside of accordions. Questions? So clear the output from an output widget? Yeah. Yes, it is. Let me add a cell back up here by the output widget. Yep, so it's out dot clear output. Okay, I should say this just in case. So um, you, you probably you may already all know this, but in the notebook you can tab complete. So I almost never, re re even if I remember, yeah, you can clear. I almost never remember what the command is. So I just hit tab and um, let the uh, notebook tell me what to do. You can also use the standard clear output function inside the output. You can say without, and inside of that, you can say clear output. The IPython display clear output function. So it works just like you would expect it, like in a normal setup. Other questions? Yep. So on the play, there is an interval. I it's commented out by now, but I assume it's in milliseconds. Uh, I tried putting a lot lower, and uh, I guess you run into the browser speed, maybe? Yeah. Um, yeah, it certainly looks like it's milliseconds. My guess is it's a request animation frame, so it has a lower bound of about 16 milliseconds. 60 hertz, 16 milliseconds. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a request animation frame. So it doesn't update faster than the refresh rate of your screen, which is a sensible lower bound. Other questions? Okay, so let's, uh, so I'm thinking let's do the output widget and then break and then do exercises. Okay. Or we can do output with it and then exercises and whenever you finish, take your break. And sure, yeah, that works. Okay, so a little bit more about the output widget. Uh, so in this case, we've added a border to the output widget and we'll come back after the break um, and talk more about widget styling. And as we saw before, you can dump output in there. We've already seen both of these. Um, so you can put widgets inside of output widgets. So we just added the slider. Uh, so this next cell I'm going to run is not going to work in Jupyter Lab. It does work in Classic Notebook. If you are looking for something to do this weekend and will be at the sprints, then this would make a great sprint project. Um, so if you're in Classic Notebook, then uh, you should have seen, you would have seen output here, but not in Jupyter Lab yet. Oh, great question about clear output. Uh, you can also use um, an output decorator to capture what comes out of a function. So um, one of the things you'll run into uh, as you, once you start writing more widgets and you're trying to debug what's going on as you're, as, as you're handling events, is um, any errors that are raised inside of an event handler don't make it into the notebook. Um, and this gives you a way of doing that. So 
we wrote a function that printed something and raised an exception um, and it decorated it with this output capture. And so back up in the output widget, here's our print statement and our exception. Printing inside of a function that is a, actually we'll cover this later. It's too complicated. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it later. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's run this. So we've got three integer slider, sliders, rather, a function that prints their values and as you adjust the sliders, the output is getting um, captured by the output widget and displayed. So here's like an interact, but you get to control how things are laid out. Yeah. So like I mentioned a moment ago for debugging errors in callbacks, output is, is really nice. Um, <laughs> I don't think I can say out loud how many hours I've spent remembering that, oh right, the errors don't get printed. So um, actually, you know what, let me take this out first because I have done this so many times. So I'm, I'm writing a widget and I, I have a button. I want something to happen when I click the button. And so uh, in this case, I'm supposed to get an exception. You know, maybe I was trying to do something more productive um, and my uh, callback function didn't seem to be doing anything. So I'm like, I, I know, I'll raise an exception inside the callback function. Surely that will break things. No. That, that this is happening behind the scenes uh, as the kernel talks to the front end. By adding in the capture widget, then when I click the button. The next cell. Ah, thank you. <laughs> Hours, I'm telling you. Um, we get the exception. So. I guess we don't get it multiple times. Uh, 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 thank you. Right, now I'm truly exceptional. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, you can use. You can also use the um, output widget if you use Python logging um, to capture log messages. But not in Jupyter Lab. Not in Jupyter Lab. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I won't hit shift return. Um, this is the same issue as before. It's just yeah. something that needs to be implemented in Jupyter Lab. So if anybody wants to, great. It, it works in the classic notebook. Yeah, what's not working is the output appending, right? Yeah. Questions? Okay. So let's take a look at the exercises. Um, so, uh, okay, let me show you one thing. So. Um, with each of the exercises, we have solutions available. So if you're at a point where you want to see what, or one way to do this, um, uncomment the load, run that, that'll drop a solution into the notebook cell, and then you'll have to run the cell again to see the solution. So I think with that, Start working on the exercises. We'll gather back together at um, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. All right, so, um, so move, or any other questions? All right, so 
um, what we'll do is we'll move on now. And I'm going to go ahead and maximize this to give us a little more room. Uh, that is full screen. OK. Actually, I can take off the toolbar. There we go. Now we have even more room. Um, so every one of the, of the widgets that comes with IPy widgets, these standard controls widgets, um, has uh, two properties that are useful for changing the styling and the layout of these widgets. So one property is the layout attribute, and the other property is the style attribute. So the layout attribute, what it does is it essentially uh, exposes to you a lot of the CSS. So CSS is the uh, way to, lay, uh, to style things in a browser. And, and what the layout attribute does is it exposes CSS essentially to you uh, so you can control the look and feel of these widgets. And in particular, what the layout property does is it lets you control sort of the outer box for the widgets. So how wide the widget is, how tall it is, a border, a background color, sort of the container that the widget lives inside of. Um, so there's a bunch of attributes like height, width, max height, max width, min height, min width, whether it's visible, overflow controls whether there's a scroll bar. Uh, for example, if you have a box, uh, do you want the box to only go so, so big and then have a scroll bar to, to, uh, to access anything else in the box? Uh, the border, the margin, the padding. So how many people here have ex any experience with CSS in a browser? OK, so a fair number of people. So this is just trying to give you some of the capabilities that you would expect uh, with a browser-based uh, thing. Um, we, use, uh, we embed the Flexbox uh, layout attributes. And uh, just recently, as in not yet released, but in the pre-release that we released last week, uh, and in the soon to be released release. Okay, let me put some numbers with that. In 7.2.1, which is the current release, we, d we just have Flexbox. In 7.3, which is a release that we'll release probably next week, and the pre release is out already, uh, we uh, also have the uh, CSS grid layout uh, attributes. Okay, so. Let's skip through a bunch of these and just go straight to the examples. I think things will be a little more explanatory. So the idea here is that um, for every widget, you have an attribute called the layout attribute, and you can give it a layout widget. And layout widget is just a widget that has all these properties, width, height, border, et cetera. And these properties are literally just the CSS. You know, you just put the string that you would put in CSS there. So if you want to look up what should be in there, look up the CSS spec for border or the CSS spec for height. You can do it in pixels and percentages, EM, which is basically anything the browser supports. So in this case, I have a button. The description is, of course, what's in the middle. The layout, it's 50%, which means 50% of my uh, window here. The height is 80 pixels. The border is two pixels dotted blue. And it's very easy to set those CSS properties. Um, one of the things uh, that gets a little uh, annoying sometimes to create a layout object. So you can just pass a dict as well. And it works just fine too. So you could just give it curly braces if you want. And it'll automatically convert that dict into a layout widget and then assign the layout widget to the widget. Um, you can, uh, so. Let's go ahead and put it back to layout. Um, you can assign the same layout to multiple widgets. It's an easy way to get consistent look and feel across many widgets. So here I'm making another button, but I'm giving it the layout that's the same layout as the first widgets. And now if I uh, set, uh, and, and because it's a widget, I can set the attributes and they're automatically communicated. So I can set the border to be one pixel uh, solid red, and because this layout is shared between both, both property, both uh, widgets have their layouts changed. So, because the layout is a widget itself, I can change its properties, and those properties are automatically communicated and changed. So you can tr dynamically change these layouts as, as as you wish. Questions? Okay. Um, the description, uh, so we, we talked a little bit about this. Uh, the description, 
you know, sometimes is too long for the thing. Uh, again, with the standard set of reference controls that came with iPy widgets, we tried to be pretty opinionated about uh, how they looked and how they fit together. And in particular, we, we, we were opinionated about how they should stack nicely next to each other. Instead of forcing you to make a grid and all this kind of stuff, we tried to make them all sort of uniform size so that you could just put them right on top of each other and it looks like they're all nice and aligned and everything. And so in particular, that said, that meant that our, like our labels are all the same width. And so they stack up really nicely and line up really nicely without you having to do any extra work. Uh, but sometimes that you know cuts off the description here, and so it's very easy for you to uh, to to adjust this. Um, here's two ways to do it. One way is to sort of deconstruct this widget. It sort of has a label on the left hand side and the slider on the right hand side. Uh, sort of smashed together in a single widget, and you can deconstruct that and make a label that's a sp that's just a, a specific label widget, and then an int slider, and you end up with something like this. You'll notice that this slider is a full width slider here, and a full width label. So that's one way to do it. You kind of mess up the nice stacking layout that you have, but it gives you the description that's as long as you want. Or you can change what we call the style. This is the second attribute that exists on all the widgets. Um, layout is about uh, controlling the CSS of sort of the box of the widget, and style lets you drill down into specific properties of the widget. And so in this case, uh, any widget that has a description property also has uh, a style attribute that, and the style attribute uh, has a description width attribute, and the description width. Uh, again, is a CSS width. Uh, initial is a CSS keyword that just says uh, do whatever you would normally do CSS, like don't pay attention to any other people saying to make you a certain width, etc. And what CSS typically does uh, for, for boxes that have text is just size them to however big the text is. And so setting the description width to initial is telling the browser, make this as wide as you need for that particular text, whatever the text is. And so what happens here is I have a slider. I've set the style attribute of this slider. And uh, in the style attribute, it has an attribute called the description width. And the description width, I've said, make that the CSS value initial, which means use as much space as you want, which means that the, tire, the, the whole width of the widget stays the same, because we're opinionated still about the whole widget being, I think, 300 pixels wide. We've reached in and we said the description can be as wide as it wants, which means the rest of the widget sort of is crammed over on the side. Um, so you pick your battles and, and you know decide what you want. Of course, you could say, uh, you know, I want the layout uh, to be more than 300 pixels. I want it to be 400 pixels. And so you can make the entire widget bigger if you want to compensate for the description being bigger if you'd like. And so these are the trade-offs you have to decide as you're laying out uh, your widgets. Um, style itself is a widget, just like layout is. Um, you can, for convenience, specify it in the, in, in the uh, initial uh, construction of a widget with a dictionary, or you can actually create a style widget. But you can see here that, uh, let's give this a name. So I is my slider, and Here's the, well, I guess it doesn't, uh, here's the style, and in particular I can set this description width to be again, you know, whatever, 30 pixels. And, and then it automatically syncs that description width back and forth to the widget. So it's sort of widgets all the way down. Um, you've got your int slider widget, and it has two sub widgets. Uh, the style widget and a layout widget. Each one of those has some properties. Layout widget is about controlling the sort of overall size and dimension and look and feel of the widget. And the style is very specific to the widget and lets you reach into different parts of the widget and control different properties of the, of the particular widget. And both of those have attributes that can sync back and forth. And I can use the style, like I can use the same style widget for all of my widgets and have the same description width uh, for everyone, just like I can with layout. Okay, questions about the style. We'll see a few more style examples at the bottom of this worksheet. All right. Um, so HBox and VBox. HBox for horizontal box, uh, VBox for vertical box. It's just a way of laying out uh, your widgets. 
So in this case, I've set up an H box that has two V boxes, and inside the V boxes, I have uh, the particular buttons that I'm making, and so I end up with this just nice grid. Um, this is a very typical thing to sort of deconstruct your layout into H boxes and V boxes, horizontal and vertical boxes. Um, up until 7.3, which hasn't been released, you know, up until now, uh, H boxes and V boxes were sort of the best we could do for trying to arrange a grid. Um, there's a very powerful capabilities coming in 7.3 that let you uh, get a real grid, a 2D grid, instead of just trying to match up, uh, you know, sort of 1D H boxes inside of V boxes inside of H boxes. Um, let's see. Uh, the label widget also does uh, math, of course. Uh, the number formatting, uh, you. When you when you have a readout field, you can specify the readout format using uh, the Python format uh, language. Okay, so flexbox. There's a bunch of text in here, and it, and essentially, so this is this is this worksheet is essentially from the IPy widgets documentation. Um, it was taken from with permission from the complete guide for to flexbox. If you want to really try to understand this flexbox system for browsers for laying out things. Uh, go read that guide. Here's just a brief overview that might get you started. Um, we'll just skip down to the examples to get an idea and we'll talk through some of the things in the examples. Um, how many people have dealt with Flexbox in the browser before? Okay, great. So let's do some examples so we can see. Okay, so what's this doing? Um, I'm constructing some layout widgets. Here the width is auto. So I, the, the button uh, default is a certain number of pixels wide, and I'm just going to let it grow however wide uh, the container is here. And uh, in this layout, I'm going to make it a flex layout. It's going to be a column, so that means things are stacked on top of each other. The line item stretch means I want everything inside the box to fill the box, uh, you know, horizontally. And the border solid, the width is 50%. So I'm trying to set the size of the box, and then I'm saying everything in there should fill. Uh, fill the size, and and I end up with the buttons that that uh, fill the size, and you know the box is 50% of my width here. Um, I can uh, have proportional sizing, um, so this is a little bit more advanced uh, uh, use of the flexbox uh, layout parameters. Um, essentially, what's happening here is I'm trying to say these buttons should have uh, different widths sort of weighted uh, with respect to each other. The bottom one is the easier one to see. Uh, essentially what it's saying is this button, think about each of these buttons as being zero sized, and this button should have uh, a three times, you know, every time I'm trying to portion out space, this button should have three times the amount of space that these do. And so you end up with a button that's, I think, three times as big as these two buttons. And you get that from uh, this right here, Oop, accidentally right clicked. Um, here's the weights right here, the one, three, and one. And again, if you read the CSS uh, spec or the Flexbox uh, layout guides, you can get pretty complicated. You can do some really cool stuff with it. You can portion sizes of things. You can have things sort of naturally flow and lay out next to each other. Um, here I'm saying, on the bottom, on the bottom rows, I'm saying this middle button should be sort of three times the size of the other buttons, a weight of three. On the top row, what's happening is uh, this auto means that each button has sort of a natural width, and and so think about sort of the total space that I have. Each button has a natural width that's going to be automatically determined, I think, by the the text inside of it. And then I'm going to take the space left over and take the space left over, I'm going to portion out three times as much space to this guy as, as to these two people. So, um, so basically, f you could think about Flexbox as really about laying things out like they should be and then taking the space left over and apportioning it to the children uh, according to these weights. And the reason why it works so nicely in this case is we're explicitly saying each of these buttons is, has, takes up no width. No width and so there's all the space left over, and now a portion all of that space left over uh, uh, with a weight of three here and a weight of one to each of the uh, side buttons. 
this can get really complicated. Get you know, you could do a lot of powerful stuff with it. Um, read the, the the Flexbox layout uh, guide either either here this the summary of, of the article or, or or the original article, and I think uh, things will help out a little more. Here's a here's a bigger example. Um, in this example, we are. Uh, again, saying I want a flex layout column, so I want to stack things. Here's the border. A line item stretch means just I want to fill things uh, from the edge to the edge here. So that's why these widgets aren't uh, a specific width. They're, 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 they're all filling the entire box uh, horizontally. And uh, here, in the, what I'm doing is I'm uh, portioning a space in between. Uh, Anyway, there's a lot of parameters here. I don't want to get too far into into the Flexbox layout because it is really a complicated spec. Um, but you can do some examples, and and we put some examples here to try to help you understand at least how to do some simple stuff. Here's something that does help you. Oh, here's one more example. Uh, here I'm setting uh, a row layout. So instead of stacking them vertically, we're stacking it horizontally. And here. Uh, I'm using a uh, particular height, and uh, you know, here's a particular width. And so with this particular width uh, for the box, there's going to be some uh, scroll bar here. So again, lots of possibilities to lay things out here. Lots of uh, control for each widget to say how, how much space it should take up. And the idea behind the flex layout is uh, you want to you want a layout that can be responsive to how wide the notebook is, how short, how small the notebook is, how big your screen is, etc. And Flex tries to give you an algorithm and give you parameters to naturally resize things to fit whatever space you're, you're, that's available. Um, this is actually a really nice uh, example. This basically goes. Let me try to get the whole example onto basically one page. This gives you a, a way to play with all the Flexbox layout parameters and just get an idea of how that, what the layout looks like here. So for example, uh, you know, I can set the flex direction to be column. And uh, of course, I can set the border. And it's changing things in, uh, in, in real time. So here's the flex flow, which is how things are. Are, are being laid out as column now. And this particular example is giving you the actual code that you would need to write to get that particular layout. So you can play with this quite a bit to try to understand better how the Flexbox parameters are, are affecting things. Um, very simply, though, we tried to make very opinionated choices with the stock default controls so that things will look nice without having to do a lot of the flexbox stretch and weights and all sorts of stuff, that things look fairly nice just stacking them right on top of each other, possibly changing the description widths if you need to have a little bit more room for your descriptions. Um, so we try to be opinionated so it's very easy to come up with something uh, that looks OK. And then if you want to go deep, this, this uh, can go pretty deep. All right, styles. Um, so a uh, button in particular has several different styles, danger, warning. This just changes uh, some values in the, in, in the button styling. Um, you, can, uh, you can also set things from the specific style attribute. And here's where I promised that we would uh, come back and look at some of the styles for some of the different widgets. Uh, so we saw up above how Basically, any widget that has a description out to the left-hand side has a sp uh, style parameter that tells you, uh, get, lets you control the width of that description. Um, buttons have a button color uh, parameter in their style attribute. So you can change it to be you know, whatever color you want. And these are CSS colors. Um, so I guess you could do something like this. Um, you can get all the style attributes for a particular button or a particular uh, control by doing that dot keys. So we also have a font weight uh, style attribute. And we're adding these attributes as people sort of request them and want them. Um, we try to be somewhat judicious uh, about using attributes that uh, a lot of people will want. Um, but 
somebody said, well, we want the font weight attribute. So, okay, you know, we'll add essentially, uh, you know, the ability to control the font weight inside the button as a specific style attribute. And again, like we said above, uh, the style is a, is a widget. It's a sub widget of your button widget in this case. And so you can assign it to other buttons as well, uh, assign it to other values as well. And another style, uh, uh, attribute that we have is the color of the uh, slider handle. And then I guess we have a list of all the style attributes. You can run this. Oh, right. Some nice person went through. Does this still work? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Some really nice person went through all of the widgets and all their names and figured out all the properties and made this nice. Uh, uh, tabular uh, crosstab thing. So, so here's all the attributes, and here's all the widgets, and the X is if that widget has that attribute, and here's all the styles, uh, the styles. So, oh, this is the. These are still keys. The these are still keys. Okay. There's the style keys. Yeah. So almost everything has a description width because we tried to have we tried to make every widget have a description uh, attribute that you can that you can uh, control. All the sliders have a handle color. Um, so I mean these these come through inheritance. So basically all the widgets that have a description inherit from the single base description widget class. All the sliders inherit from something that has this uh, handle color uh, uh, style. So we have font weights. Uh, and, and that's about it, I guess, right now. Okay, questions about styles or layouts? Yes? Uh, is Bootstrap supported? Is what? Bootstrap library. Which oh. Nice. Um, no. Um, you'll notice that the, the, where is it? The button, wherever it was, the button styles, here it is. This actually came from Bootstrap. We originally, uh, uh, the widgets originally were written with Bootstrap, and we've moved away from Bootstrap. Uh, but for backwards compatibility, we kept some of these these names and tried to mimic the Bootstrap styles. But but the short answer is no. But there's still some effect from when we previously did have Bootstrap styling. Other questions? Layouts and styling. Yes. Good question. Um, so the question was, uh, is this going in the direction, or can, maybe it, if I can rephrase your question just a little bit, would it be possible in the future to have a CSS file where each widget has a particular ID and your CSS file uh, controls, those, controls those IDs? Okay, so um, the answer is slightly different than, the, than the, what the question was asked. Uh, the problem with using IDs is that you can only have one ID on a page at a time, but you can have multiple widgets that are representing the same underlying model on the page at a time. So IDs is not the way to do that, but classes is the way to do that. And you can assign classes to a button or to, to any widget. Um, let's take this button, for example. Let's put so you can assign uh, add class and give it a class. And now that button has that class uh, applied to it. And now if you want to separately put some CSS on the page that styles things with that particular class, uh, you're more than welcome to. Um, so, that's, so that's the way you can sort of have an escape hatch to do whatever you want with the CSS styling. And then you can reach down. The, the caveat with that is that uh, the DOM structure of these widgets is explicitly not a public API and not something that we support uh, as a stable API. And so, so if you're messing with things like inside the widget that's explicitly tied to the DOM structure of the widget, then, uh, then it might break on an update. Um, that's why we have sort of a very constrained uh, style property that lets you 
those that's the public API that we maintain going forward as a stable API. Um, but certainly you can add a class and you can put CSS on the page if you need an escape hatch. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Great. Where would you put the CSS file? Yeah, that's a good question. Again, this is an escape hatch. Please don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you really need to. Like, it's, it's there. You can do it. Um, yeah, so if you were embedding widgets on a standard HTML page, you have control over what CSS is on that HTML page. If you wanted to make like a dashboard or a web app, um, you can put CSS on a page doing a, a percent HTML and then style blah, 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 blah. Um, be careful with that sort of thing because like in JupyterLab, you might have two notebooks open and if you're applying styling to an entire page, you might be affecting the other notebook. So you got to be careful with how you're putting styling on the page. Um, but there's, there's, some, there's some ways to get styling on the page. In JupyterLab, you could write an extension or put it in the theme or something like that. Uh, in the classic notebook, oh, interesting. In the classic notebook, uh, you, know, you can also use the percent percent HTML to put some styling on the page. I think you could maybe have a percent CSS. You can at least do a percent HTML to put some styling on the page. Other questions? Actually, technically, you could use an HTML widget to put styling on the page if you really wanted to. <laughs> if you wanted to keep it widgets all the way down. <laughs> okay, so I think there's, uh, there's some uh, exercises for the widget layouts. So, uh, Matt, do you want to describe these? Uh, sure. And then we'll go into the widget events. Right. So within the next hour, we'll have written a simple password generator. This is actually more complicated than what's shown in this GIF is, is more complicated than what we're going to end up doing. There are a series of exercises here which um, have you go through practicing some of these layout things. So I think we'd set in 10 minutes for this. Sure. Uh, you'll probably want to have the styling notebook open also. Um, and each of the exercise boxes, I've tried to mark where it is that you need to change things. So go ahead and start and raise your hands when we have questions. As our approach to this was rather than reading you the really long style document, it made more sense to us to put together some exercises that would force you to di di digest it a little bit more. So maybe take down the green things from your computer and then uh, put it back up when you're done. And of course, the orange things if you uh, have a question. So a lot of you may be confused that you're not seeing very much effect. Again, Flexbox is about taking the space left over and apportioning that out how you're asking to. So if your width is constrained so that there's no space left over, then you won't see much of a difference. So if you want to see sort of how it's trying to space things out, make your, make your browser window wider, et cetera, to, to really see how it's uh, spacing things out. We'll probably give it another minute. We're running just a few minutes behind, so so give it another minute or so. Ask for questions, and then and then move on. Believe me, you can spend months of your life.
tweaking layouts. <laughs> We've done it, and I've seen many people do it. At the end of that, it's always like a physicist designed it. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move on. We, you have solutions to all of those, so you should be able to, to peek at the solution if you want to move forward faster uh, or, or, or keep trying if you want to probably remember the solution better. Um, we want to uh, cover events though, but first, any, any questions that came up from the layout uh, stuff? Okay, we have a question for you. Sounds like a professor. Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay, if you don't have a question for me, I've got one for you. <laughs> that will teach you. Um, so, so we could, with some amount of effort, modify that. Um, where was it? The styling demo widget. It, it's not in here anymore. Okay, let's pretend that didn't happen. Uh, so with, with some effort, this could be turned into a widget where you, so you've got your widget that you're defining. We could uh, change this so that you can attach that widget to these controls adjust the layout interactively, and then copy and paste Python out at the top. Would that be help, really helpful thumbs up, or eh, whatever, or don't bother? OK, so the people who are responding are saying, yes, I'd like that. OK, thanks. <laughs> thanks for participating in our user survey. OK, um, so, so let's move on to widget events. So that was about setting up things, and this is about uh, actually imparting activity interaction to the widgets. Um, so I guess uh, this is for Python 2. Um, okay, so there's a couple of different ways to add uh, actions based on uh, widget events. Um, the button is a little bit uh, specific uh, and, and, and different uh, in this way. Uh, you, with the button, you can do something when you click. And you can do that by registering an on-click handler. Here's the documentation for it. Essentially, the, uh, the, the you register it by giving it the function. And you can say remove equals true in order to actually remove the registration. So here's an example. So click me. Um, what you'll notice here is that, here, let me comment this out so that you can see uh, what happens here. Here, if I click me, it appears that nothing's happening. Uh, in the classic notebook, you'll actually see the, the stuff printed out. This is one difference between the classic notebook and JupyterLab. Um, in Jup in JupyterLab, uh, we're a little more correct with how we do things, uh, and we insist that you uh, capture any output inside of an output widget. So here, uh, uh, I'm displaying the button and the output widget. You can't see the output widget. We can uh, there now. You can see the output widget, and now as you click it, 
the output widget is capturing the print that's happening in that button handler. Um, uh, so that's, that's how to get a function run uh, when the button's clicked. Um, an easier way to do this uh, in, both IPA, in both Classic Notebook and in JupyterLab is to use that decorator output dot capture. Oh, there we go. And this also works as well. Um, so you can register a function to be run whenever a button's clicked. And if you want to print something, then make sure you're capturing that output in, a, in an output widget. Um, for most of the widgets, though, uh, it's not a, a specific click function that you're registering. Most of the widgets, what we have is anytime this particular value changes, run this other function. And so this is using the observe, uh, the observe uh, uh, function uh, method of, on a widget. And basically, the observe method takes a handler. It takes uh, a list of attributes that uh, we're going to listen to. And it takes uh, an event type that we're going to listen to. And right now, there's basically one event type called the change event. Um, so the type right now is m mainly for forwards compatibility if we decide to have uh, more different, uh, different types of events. Uh, but what we'll often use is the handler. That's the actual function we're going to run when a value changes and then the names saying which attributes of a, of a widget to listen to. So let's do an example. Um, so here, what we're going to do is we're creating an int slider and an output widget. Uh, we're capturing the print statement so we can actually see when this function is running. And we're saying the int slider, we're going to observe. It's a little bit uh, kind of a maze here. We're going to observe this particular attribute of the int slider. And when this attribute changes, we're going to call this function. And so what you'll see here is as we change the value of the slider, uh, the function's called, and the function is appending something to this output widget. Uh, I'll point out that uh, this is run if it changes on the front end, but it also is run if it's changed on the back end. Uh, so if I change the value here, uh, the functions still run. So as, a, as something observing the widget, you can't tell whether or not the user clicked it or if it was programmatically changed. Um, but the idea is that all you care about is that the state of that widget changed, uh, the particular value that you're listening to changed, and then you can react to those changes. So observe your handler and uh, the, the attributes that you're actually listening to. Uh, your handler is given this change object. Uh, this change object uh, has a couple of properties, and it's listed in this documentation here. Uh, the couple of properties are the, the type of notification, the owner, so you get a handle on the actual widget that was changing, uh, the old value, the new value, and the name of the attribute that changed. And you can, uh, you can actually uh, use the dictionary syntax, or you can just do it like this too change.new uh, for convenience. OK, questions about how to hook up a handler to a change event? OK. Oh, yeah. So what is the value? Value is the attribute of the slider that I'm listening to. So in this, in this case, the value is wherever the slider uh, handle is. I could listen to the max of the slider. Uh, what's going on? <laughs> so just delete the minimum and you'll be good. OK. So here I'm listening to the max. And if I change the value, notice nothing happens. But if I change the max, <laughs> you have you have some autocorrect on your computer. Yeah. If I change the max, then the handler's triggered. And you could just eliminate this, and that would listen to any change on any attribute of that widget. Um, so, so that's a, sort of the, the sledgehammer way of interacting or uh, responding to any change in the widget. Uh, sometimes what you want to do is just synchronize widgets. So like your handler is just setting the value of another widget to make sure that the values stay in sync. And this is what the link 
uh, does. We saw the link before. Uh, just real quick again, the link function takes a widget and an attribute and another widget and its attribute and it just registers basically a change line law on each widget saying when that value changes, when that attribute changes, set, the, set this attribute on this other widget and vice versa. And so what's happening here is that these two sliders are synchronized. Now what's literally happening is slider one is changing in JavaScript. Its value is getting synced back to Python kernel. This link is seeing that value change and it's running in Python to set the other value, the other widget's value. And then that other widget's value is getting synced back to JavaScript and then updating the slider. So there's sort of a round trip to the kernel happening here. Um, D-link is a one directional link. It says when the source attribute value changes, set the target value to that, to whatever the value was for the source attribute, but it doesn't go the, the other direction. So in this case, the source changes the target, but the target doesn't change the source. And when it's different, then as soon as I change the source, that handler runs and it syncs back up again. Um, you can unlink these things, which just deregisters the change notifications. These are just convenience functions. You could do this with registering <coughs> two change notifications on each, uh, a change notification on each widget. It's just convenient to be able to just say link, make sure these two values stay the same. Um, all right, so uh, we have a bunch of attributes that are passed in uh, to this change handler, like the new, and you can do a bunch of stuff with it. So here, uh, I'm changing the value. Here, I'm not just linking the two values. I'm actually doing some programmatic uh, changing of this text value. Uh, you know, if the new is less than zero, then set this other thing's value to be one string or another string. And so I can be a little bit smarter about uh, these change notifications. Um, I said before, when you do a link, it's actually a round trip from the front end where you're interacting back to the Python side where actually the sync is happening and then uh, the value is sent back. Um, that's great and all, but it's a little bit of latency uh, to do that round trip. And if you end up putting these widgets on a web page without a kernel, then you don't get that interact you don't get that syncing. And so we provided a, an, a different way of uh, syncing these widgets. Uh, the JS link function basically <laughs> syncs them in JavaScript. So in this case, as I change range one, in JavaScript, the range two slider is actually listening to the range one slider uh, values. And so there's no round trip to the kernel. Instead, as I change range one, range two in JavaScript is listening to it and it changes it and then both independently sync back to the kernel. And so the, the syncing happens in, happens in JavaScript. And, the sync, and then each independently communicate their, their value back to the Python side. And JSD link is the same, but directional linking, just like uh, the Python uh, directional linking. And you can unlink those as well. And then we already talked about continuous updates. Um, so this is an example that illustrates the continuous updates. Uh, for the first two, uh, I've said continuous update false. For the second two, I said continuous update uh, true. And then I linked everything together, everything to A's value. So you can see nothing updates as I change A because it's continuous update false. So essentially it's not communicating its update until I let go of the slider and then everything updates. And same thing here. Uh, as I'm typing the number, nothing changes until I press enter or move outside of the text box and then the change is communicated, as opposed to these where uh, as I'm dragging the slider, the change is communicated in real time. Or here, see I'm cha the change is communicated in, in real time. Okay, so there's a short overview of how to hook up uh, changes in widgets, but really the, the philosophy here is each widget has state, the values of the attributes, and you react to changes on those states. And it, except for the button click where it's actually an action that you're reacting to, almost always in the widgets the philosophy is you react to changes in the state of the widget. Okay, questions? Yes? Um, so, uh, 
Yeah, good question. Why do you not use the JavaScript way of linking? Why, why do you use link instead of always using JS link? Um, Oh yeah, <laughs> Martin and I have had this conversation quite a bit. Um, sometimes in the implementation of the widget, so for example, uh, when you have uh, the select dropdown, what's actually synced over to the, you have a bunch of uh, convenience attributes that are on the Python side that aren't on the JavaScript side. So when you uh, have a dropdown and you select the value, you have a dot value on the Python side, but you don't have a dot value on the JavaScript side. Instead, what's hap what happens on the JavaScript side is we just keep track of the actual index number. And so, so you can't do a JS link for the value in a dropdown. Yeah, thanks for reminding about that. Any other questions? Okay, so we have another uh, exercise about password generation. And the caveat with all of these things is, please don't use this as a real password generator. <laughs> <laughs> we did use the Python secrets library, but remember the syncing is happening uh, in plain text between your kernel and your browser. <laughs> so don't actually use this as a password generator, but it's a nice small constrained uh, UI that you can build. So question, uh, in, this, in, in our schedule we've got uh, about, th these exercises will take about 30 minutes and then a break. The food goes away at four o'clock. So you could, oh. we could if you prefer, we can take a break now. Yeah. Okay, we'll go, we'll go ahead and do a break now. Um, this is your last chance for food for this, the, the afternoon. And let's be back by four. All right, let's get started back up. Um, we are going to spend the next 15 minutes or so writing a password generator. Um, as uh, Jason indicated, please don't go out and use that um, in the real world to generate your passwords. Um, so we want the password generator to look like this uh, once we're done with it. Um, and the first step here Tell you what, I think in the interest of time. Tell people to do a solution? Yeah. <laughs> well, so, so there's a bunch of widget libraries you want to show off. Here, what I'd like to practice is some of the event stuff. So rather than having you construct the widgets, just go ahead and load the solution here to get. You have to start running up with the, the software. Right. Yeah. Right, so there's an import with our uh, import cell up at the very top you have to run and then um, uncomment the solutions to bad pass 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 one widgets or whatever it is so that you've got a widget that looks like this in the browser so it won't generate a password yet but we've got the controls in place um, so we've provided a function in the next cell here to calculate a password and it needs a couple things you need to do. So the first is add a line at the end of the function that will set the value of the widget password text. So the um, value will be calculated in the function, put into the, the um, put into the variable password and we want to use that to set the value of this of the password text widget, which is the one up here. Okay, so when we run this, it doesn't do anything. We haven't called the function yet. Um, okay, so Somebody remind me, um, what I want to have happen is I drag the slider and the password value updates. So if I want to do something in response to the slider changing, which object do I start with? The slider widget, the, the password widget, which, which one of those? Okay, so I got to start with the slider, which was called password length. Okay. 
And then what method is it, I, what, what is it that I want to do? Yep, I want to observe the password length slider. And when something happens, I want to call my function calculate password. And so now, that's disappointing. Oh, do I have to, yeah, I do have to give it a name, don't I? That's a positional argument, so you can you don't have to say names equals. You can just do the function, comma, the names. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why it's not yes, I am. Um, display buffer. What's what's your what's your sorry. What's your solution that you didn't load? That's a fine question. Let's take a look. No, the, the one above it. Same as what I have. Okay. Word for word. <laughs> <laughs> How about start writing fresh? There might be some extra widgets that are not the widgets that are there, et cetera. Okay. There we go. Okay, I have no idea what happened there. Um, I, as you can see, I changed absolutely no code <laughs> and just reran the cells. This can be confusing sometimes. Sometimes what happens is you define a widget and then you set up a function and then you redefine the widget, like you run the cell again, and so now you've created a new widget, but the function has a handle on the old widget, not the new widget, and so you have to redefine the function again, too, so that it's paying attention to the current global widget. Anyway, sometimes, my guess is that's the sort of thing that happened here. Yeah, so we haven't mentioned it yet, but one of the most useful features of notebooks is restart and run all cells. <laughs> um, it's especially true with widget programming. <laughs> Well, but you were at the Jupyter Lab tutorial this morning, and so you know you can write your own keyboard shortcut for that. I did recently discover the command thing. Okay, so this was, uh, except for the order of execution problem we had, um, fairly easy to set up this um, straightforward password generator. We're going to do another run through with this. And the idea with our next run through is going to be, it would be nice to start to separate a little bit the logic of generating the password from the widgets. So you can imagine if we're making a real password generator, we, we might want to test the password generator in an automated way, not in a browser, with a whole bunch of different possible settings. Right now, the way we've written this, you can't. Because if you try to run the uh, calculate uh, uh, password function, it's going to expect there to be a password text widget somewhere that's been defined and has a value property. So our next notebook is going to end up with exactly the same um, same widget. Now we're, we're trying to separate out the logic from the rest of the widget, and so we've written a function that just calculates a password given the length. And so this you could put into an automated test or whatever you want to do with it. Um, run it at the command line, make sure it gives you the results you're expecting. Um, the GUI code so far is the same as what we had before. So we've got the same controls again. And now we'll write a function that updates the value of the password text whenever the password length is changed. So we start at the bottom. So when the password length um, is changed, we're, we're 
that's what we're observing. We're going to call our update password function. The update password function calls calculate password to get the new password and then sets that value. And so once again, we've got a password generator. So the change from the last time, the only change from the last time really, is that um, the password calculation has been factored out into a separate function that you could you know, change and test it whenever you want to with it. Um, the other nice thing is that way in IPy widgets 10, when there's some change to the Python API, you don't have to update your, cal your, your password calculating part of the code. Um, I think I'm gonna skip the interact stuff actually. In this case, you could do the widget the way we have it, just using interact. So uh, there's a third way to do this, and um, there's a couple of new features in here that we haven't described yet that I want I want to make sure we hit. Um, so this in this approach, we're going to end up with the same password generator as before. We're going to have one class that we define for the widget, so that somebody could or for the graphical part of it, so that somebody could conceivably input the, import that widget and use it like a box or a slider or whatever. Um, a separate class for handling the logic and then um, a class to bring the two of them together. Um, did I run? Yes, I did, okay. Uh, so m most of the code here is the same GUI code we had before. It's just I'm putting it inside the init of a class. Um, I'm creating the helpful text and the password text and password length as um, attributes of the class. And I'm subclassing from widgets vbox so that everything will be laid out vertically. So, so far, so good. I can move the slider, nothing happens yet. Um, it would be nice if this had a value, so you can imagine that if you're using this past gen widget that we're writing, you'd like to be able to do pastgen.value because all the other widgets have values and so it'd be nice to pull out the value as a password. Um, you maybe don't want the user to be able to set a password. And so in this next cell I've added a property for the values so that you can get the value out but you can't set it because I don't want the, the user to bypass my fancy password generator that's ultra secure um, by just setting their password to ABC or something. So now I'm, and this feels a little bit like overkill in this case, um, I'm making a class to simply calculate the password and calculating the password is just generating a random string. Um, there is one, new thing in here, a couple new things in here. So where I'm going with this class is I want the class to have traits that I can link to the widget properties. So that when I connect these two together, I don't have to write function callbacks. I'll take a trait from the logic class, a trait from the GUI class, and just link those together. And then when one of them changes, the other one gets updated without me having to do anything. And so uh, my password generator, I'm gonna subclass, subclass from has traits, which is from traitlets, which is a class that provides the things that you link together. Um, and you define your traits here as ha they have to be defined as class at attributes, not instan instance at attributes. And then I can observe for changes in the length. And whenever ch a change in the length happens, th th this method gets called. And Oh, I have to execute the cell. So when I run that, um, I get a generated password. So in this first example, I had to just print the generated password to the screen. Um, in a moment, we'll do that in a slightly different way. So what we're gonna do instead is we're going to make a trade for holding the password. So, and, and what the calculate password method will do is when length changes, calculate password gets called, calculate password finds a new password and saves it in this logic um, classes password field. Oops, again, have to run it. 
So if we do that and I set the length to 110 and print out the password, I get a 110 character password. Great. Unfortunately, I can set a negative length password, which is not so desirable, I'm told, from the security point of view. Um, and so uh, one other thing you can do is um, validate the value of a trait. And there's a decorator from Traitlets for doing that. So I want to validate the trait length. And the way you do that is you, you, you define a method. It doesn't matter what you call the method. The method will get an argument proposal uh, that's a dictionary that contains the new value. You go through and um, put in whatever logic you want for deciding whether or not the trait is valid. If it's not valid, you raise an exception, a particular type of exception. Otherwise, you return the good value. So in that binary star simulation that I showed you at the beginning, for example, you don't want a negative mass star. And now if we try setting a negative value, we get a trade error. Okay, so now we've got two pieces. We've got a class for the um, graphical interface that we called past gen GUI. We've got a class um, for the logic that we called past gen logic, and I'm going to make one more class to tie those together. Um, so all this, so I'm subclassing from the GUI. So this will behave like the password generator um, that we're interacting interacting with. I make a instance of the model to um, hold my password, and then all I'm doing to connect the model up to the widgets is a couple of links. And so now when um, the password length slider changes here, that will be linked to the model password length. When the password length changes in the model, that triggers the observe to update the password. The password um, is updated in the model in this past gen logic class, and that password is linked back to the GUI element in our widget. And so, right, you have to execute the cell. Don't just talk about the cell. So there we go. So this last way of doing things is maybe a little bit easier if you're going to provide fairly extensive widgets where it's nice, you've got some complicated logic like modeling a binary star, um, you have some complicated user interface and you'd like to be able to test that interface without, it, without worrying about testing the logic at the same time and then tie them together in a straightforward way. Questions? Okay, so are you, are you switching computers now? Okay. So um, <clears throat> my name is uh, Martin Bredels, and um, do we have screen? Yeah. Is this large enough? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so what you saw until now were um, basically the basic widgets that come with iPy widgets. Uh, but it's not just buttons and sliders, it's a framework on which they're built. And using this framework, you can build like new uh, widgets on top of this. And, and that's actually how I got into iPy widgets. Uh, I had a, like a visualization li library or a piece of JavaScript, and you could push data to it, but it was not like interactive. It wouldn't send data back. I wanted to have buttons, sliders, and I, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. So I started like creating a widget uh, library uh, called iPyVolume. I'll de demonstrate this uh, later. Um, and then it basically ties all together. So you can put in the sliders, etc. Um, so let me let me show some of that. Uh, so if you want to build your own widget after this, um, on the iPy widget website, there's a tutorial. Uh, there's a more in-depth tutorial, uh, this uh, Medium article. 
and you can use cookie cutters to uh, to set everything up to uh, so you don't have much boilerplate to worry about. So let's start with BQplot. Um, so BQplot was uh, um, developed at Bloomberg. Uh, you can think of it as a, an a interactive uh, uh, widget library for, for a a visualization bridging um, uh, D3. Um, so many of the IDs are, are, um, come from the grammar of uh, graphics, um, as you'll see now. So there are actually two interfaces, one that I really like, which is the, like the high-level uh, plotting interface, which looks like uh, matplotlib, uh, and a, a lower level, which is a, basically a, a library of all the widgets. So just some imports and, and generating some data. So we import the pyplot interface. <clears throat> and this looks like matplotlib, but instead of getting a static image, you have an interactive visualization. So you have line plots, scatter plots, and also this one is interactive, or histograms. But every component is a widget. So let's make a similar plot, but now using the, uh, not the high level, but the lower level uh, API. Um, so using the grammar of graphics, you have to uh, define what the scale is, but basically translates from data to uh, like uh, visual properties, could be coordinates or uh, colors, uh, some data, you create lines, axes, and the figure which is uh, built up, uh, which basically uh, builds the whole uh, figure, and you have this, this data set. And line is a widget, so line is this thing, and if you modify the traits, like with any widget, it updates it. So it's really like a live, live plot. Same with the scatter plot. And everything's animated. And that's really useful if you want to um, uh, see what the effect is of like uh, uh, changing a parameter and you see the data changing, that's m way more useful than, than basically seeing the image suddenly change. So that can be really useful. Um, so also the XS, which is a scale. So let me go back. So this is a linear scale. Um, so the minimum is not set, so it's computed from the data. But if we set it, or set it to none again, then it computes it from data. So every property can be changed. So also the x-axis, if you change the label, it's directly reflected in the, uh, in the plot. Um, so let's build, let's go a bit quickly. <clears throat> uh, this plot where you can have a selector. So this is really nice selector where the height gives you the, uh, the uh, width and the location, and say you want to select this region. And because it's widget, it, the, the selection, so what you selected gets synchronized to the kernel, so we can access this. Or maybe we need to cheat a little bit and say, well, this looks much better. There are tools for... Well, it could also be useful to draw sometimes a function. Like, it's difficult to express in a function, but you know how to draw it. It's, uh, it's pretty easy. And you can then access what I've drawn and input this into your model or whatever. And in some, uh, one of the examples, we're going to uh, move points around. So this is a demo where you can take a point and move it, and the line shows the mean of this. Uh, so you can, you can use it, for instance, uh, if you have a model, so what's the influence of this particular data point on whatever you're computing? So this is also a pretty nice feature. <clears throat> so another library built on, on top of uh, uh, IPyWidget is called uh, Py3.js. Um, so it is a bit of a low-level library. Uh, so Py3.js uh, uh, basically is built on uh, a 3.js, which is a, like a scene graph library for uh, doing WebGL rendering. Um, so let's... Uh, uh, Let's uh, make a, a rendering. Uh, and as you see, you need to set up a lot. So you need to create a mesh, a camera, a, a light, a scene, and a renderer. And then you have, 
and a control to uh, move this. And again, all of them are widgets, so if we sh change something, oh, we can change them from the kernel, change all the properties. So this is a nice example of a, of a, of a surface where you can select points on this surface. And this is using WebGL, so it's, the performance is really great. Um, and again, you can change everything because it's a, it's a widget. Um, okay. So using the same library, uh, 3JS, but um, is um, IPyVolume is also using 3GS, but uh, IPyVolume is more like a, a plotting library. So it's uh, similar to the uh, 3D plotting of uh, matplotlib. Uh, so uh, just import IPyVolume, NumPy, and IPyWidgets, and it looks pretty similar to the PyPlot interface of uh, a matplotlib. So you create a figure, a scatter, and you show it. And so now we have an interactive 3D plot. Um, so if you happen to uh, uh, own a Google Carport, you could uh, uh, even do uh, like stereo rendering. So you may be wondering, okay, but how do I get this on my phone? Um, so in iPad volume, it's pretty easy to uh, create a standalone HTML file. So let's say you, you created your, uh, uh, like a nice plot you want to show to a colleague. Uh, you want to bring this on your uh, tablet. You just save it to an HTML file. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, trust me. <laughs> this usually works. Um, Uh, so let's take a look. Mm. It's the file called standalone. 170 kilobytes. It's, it's not so large. Yeah. <laughs> so this is something you can render on your phone, put in your Google Cardboard, and you can like see it in, uh, in VR. Um, you can also do uh, quiver plots. So this shows the directional. So if you have uh, like a vector field you want to visualize. Let me make this a bit smaller. And again, because it's, uh, well, that's basically the reason to, to implement this in IPy widgets is we I don't have to create sliders because they're already built and I can easily link them together. So if I want to link the size of the quiver uh, to a slider, it's just one line. So now I can change these using the sliders. I have a color picker, so you don't have to reinvent all the wheels, just a few. And you have a nice linking, just a few lines of code. Um, so there's animation support in IPy volume. So that's all happening on the uh, on the client. So you just send a, a, a piece of data, uh, like a, t a set of time series. And what you see here, what you saw b uh, probably before was the, uh, the play widget. So let's play this. And if you look at the slider, so the time step is pretty large. But because everything's interpolated, like every, if you change something, uh, it takes the old value, the new value interpolates, it looks pretty smooth. So these are just 14 time steps, but it looks really smooth. So you can get away with a really coarse time step so, not, so that your files also not become, uh, become too large if you want to show this on a, on a tablet. So everything's interpolated, so also uh, the sizes and colors. So this is the same. But now, um, for each point, there's a color and a size. So you see this wave, this, the sizes are changing, the colors are changing, and they're all interpolated. Can you show the full screen mode? Yeah, you 
can do it full screen as well. Okay, doesn't want to exit. Okay. Um, let me stop this. Yeah. So shortly on IPy leaflet, uh, Jason will uh, uh, say a bit more about this. So IPy leaflet is built on uh, leaflet. It's a uh, it's a map wid widget, so interactive as well. And of course you can. Uh, it, again, it's a widget, so any property can be changed. So you can change the zoom level using a slider if you prefer that, or using this interface. So Jason will say say a bit more about this. So why I was interested in these libraries and build this new library was um, the reason for that, and I need to change to the classical notebook for this. Was a library I created uh, called Fax, which is a um, a library that gives you out-of-core data frames, so it's it's a bit like pandas, but for larger uh, larger data sets. And one of the things it does is visualization. I wanted to, these to be like interactive. So what I have here is the New York Taxi data set for 2015. So it contains the drop-off and the pickup locations for, in this case, 150 million uh, taxi trips. How big is that? Uh, 23 gigabytes. <clears throat> so it's 23 gigabytes, but um, it's using memory mapping, so it doesn't matter how many times you open it, etc. Basically, does everything lazy. And using IPA leaflet, you can overlay an image. So it, what it does, it uh, every time you change. So I'm basically observing the changes of the uh, of the IPA leaflet map, and every ch every time something changes, I calculate. Uh, like a density map, uh, do some coloring, make an image, and overlay this on top. So you're scanning through all 23 gigabytes every time it changes. Is that right? Uh, I'm using well, I do not all the da all, only the data that's necessary. Okay. Yeah. So this is a nice view of the uh, the airport, JFK airport. Um, so let's take a dark matter simulation. So this is 120 million rows. Um, so here you don't want to overlay it on a map. So here I'm using a BQ plot. And again, each time you zoom in, it waits a little bit, recomputes. So, th so the previous libraries I showed you were like new uh, IPy widget libraries built on top of IPy uh, uh, widgets. And this is a library that's using these components to build applications. And one of the things uh, um, why I built this uh, 3D library uh, was that we can now, using volume rendering, display these huge data sets also in, uh, in 3D. So now you see it here in 3D. So this is basically creating a density in 3D and visualizing that using volume rendering. Um, and what you can now do is, you, if you want to zoom in, it waits a little bit, computes it, and you can zoom into really large data sets and really go into the uh, uh, into the uh, detail you wanna wanna get at. So, what's the largest data set that you've worked with? Um, so, all this work was basically for uh, the Gaia uh, data set, and that's 1.7 billion uh, rows. So, and that works not on my laptop, but on a computer <coughs> we had. Uh, it takes about half a second to to visualize all of that. Okay. Well, we can talk later. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if we can get this working. <laughs> what? Did I miss something? Yeah, you, you accidentally renamed it. There you go. Okay. So there's another library called IPy Web, WebRTC, which is a. Um, a library that exposes the WebRTC capabilities of the browser, and that's something that Google kind of pushed to get uh, Google Hangout into the browser. But it also caused the, the how should I say, the uh, uh, new API, the media, media Stream API, that cre kind of puts, uh, ah, wait. I should also do this from the uh, classical notebook. 
So if you read this using master, well, no, you have to use master. And that's in this environment. Okay, so you can have a, a okay, well, let's skip the video. We'll use the camera twice. So, uh, hi everybody. Um, and iPy Volume can take a media stream, which could be a camera or a, a, a video, in this case twice the camera, because I don't know where the video is. And you can put this into uh, iPy Volume, uh, which is because the browser is such a powerful platform, you can just like pass it anything for a texture. Uh, and this happens to be uh, like a, um, uh, the camera, which is a media stream. But also the canvas itself is a media stream. So at some moment I was like, does this work? Like, can I do this? Yeah, you can plot <laughs> itself on itself. And I was like, okay, the browser is a pretty nice platform. So you can create these like really psychedelic things. But what it's actually uh, made for is uh, uh, video conferencing. So let's try that out. Yeah. So these are connected over Wi-Fi using the WebRTC. They basically try, try to find, uh, find ways to uh, uh, to find each other. And, okay, I need to hold this. And again, this this is a media stream, this thing on the right. So I, I can also plot this on here. And then you can like do crazy things as well. And maybe you think, oh man, I need to record this. So also the a media stream can be recorded so we can take this, record this, stop this. Let's see if it worked. Yeah. <laughs> so we can make this recording and download this, etc. And actually, I did this uh, to make a like a uh, to record a, a 180 degrees movie for. Uh, so I'll give a talk on fr Friday. Yeah. And I'll show you how I created like a, 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 a 3D, well, not a 3D a movie for uh, displaying on a, in a dome. Okay. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Do you want to continue? Oh, sure. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> Thank you. I'll switch to Chrome because I can maximize better in Chrome. Okay, so I just want to emphasize again, everything you saw there was using IPy widgets to synchronize between the front end and the back end. And the power of that, so we were teaching you some tools for interacting with changes with IPy widgets, uh, for listening to changes, to you know running your own stuff and affecting other things, and you know setting values that would then be propagated to the front end, et cetera. And while it seems kind of like we're playing in a little tiny sandbox, you know, with the you know I changing a slider and I set a value of a text box and stuff like that, the real power, like the real cool parts of this, come when you have a library like BQ Plot or IPy Volume or Python.js or something like this, where you have uh, you know, a graph and the selection is being communicated to the back end and you can listen to whenever that selection changes. And when the selection changes, you run another model and you affect the 3D plot over here, et cetera. And so you can have 
these totally dynamic interfaces, the the reference controls, the sliders and text boxes and stuff like that are just really sort of pretty standard minimal reference controls for user interactions. But IPy Volume and BQ Plot and some of these other tools are really trying to push forward. Uh, you know what's possible if you can interact with your data and have those interactions then spawn further calculations that then come back and are visualized in other ways, et cetera. And it's really exciting to see uh, not just the the IPy widget sliders and checkboxes and things like that being used to design interfaces, but to see each one of these tools that sort of is participating in a common framework. Uh, to be used together. So you have a slider that controls a BQ plot and the BQ plot that you can select in the BQ plot and that controls the selection uh, and a visualization in the 3D, which then controls a map, et cetera. Like everyone's participating in the same framework. So each person sort of brings together uh, a, a powerful platform, makes a powerful platform. Okay, so I just wanted to show uh, real briefly some interesting things you can do in JupyterLab. Uh, with IPy widgets, some of the capabilities that JupyterLab gives you, and use as a demonstration platform the IPy Leaflet uh, library. Uh, how many people work with geographic data? Seismology, yes, yeah, some USGS people, et cetera. Okay, so, um, so, so I'll show you uh, some of the work that's been done recently. Martin, I think you worked on this, and Sylvan worked on this, I worked on it, and other people, you've worked on it, right? Uh, IPy Leaflet. No, okay, he might work on it eventually. <laughs> okay, and Sylvan's worked on it. So a bunch of people have worked on this library and tried to push it forward. The nice thing about this is that, uh, uh, is that um, there's a ton of people investing a ton of time and, and expertise in designing nice uh, libraries in JavaScript for the browser. And what we're doing is we're, we're building on top of those shoulders uh, to just wrap their nice three, 3D libraries to wrap the nice, you know, WebGL or the the WebRTC APIs to wrap the nice uh, uh, plotting libraries or the the geographic libraries, and and just expose those to this sort of interactive computation uh, platform that we have. Okay, so uh, let me open up uh, this example again. I'll make this a little bit bigger. Collapse the sidebar. Okay, so this is, um, oh, didn't want to do that quite yet. So this is a uh, the IPy leaflet map that, that Martin uh, presented. So one thing you can do is you know put the map right here in your in your notebook, and then as you do stuff with the map, you know like zoom on it. This is makes it an interactive slider automatically. Okay, that changed the map a little bit. I can, you know, clear the layers so that it's sort of blank again. I can add another uh, another tile map on top of it. Uh, I can, you know, print whatever the current interactive state of this map is. But you can see pretty soon I'm getting to the point where, you know, it's scrolling up and I'm trying to do interactive stuff to this this thing that's like living way up there. And so it'd be nice if I could sort of pull that output out so that I can have it sitting over on the side while I interactively work with that particular output. And JupyterLab makes this really easy. You can just right click, create new view for output. And what this does is it copies this output to a new tab. And it's exactly the same output. It's exactly the same, it's a new view for, this, uh, for the model. So it's like rendering that map in two different outputs, except it's in a new tab instead. So you can see as I change one, the other is automatically affected because they're, they're both talking to the same model. So the nice thing about this in JupyterLab though is I can put it out beside it and then I can keep working here. And uh, you know, as I work with it, I add a marker. So there's my marker that I added. Um, I can change the opacity using a slider, et cetera. And now I really have this interactive feel here. I can pull it out keep it over to the side and start working with it, kind of like you would do like a matplotlib plot if you were doing the interactive matplotlib plots or many other sort of workflows where you pull it off to the side and now you're gonna sort of work with that object all throughout your notebook. Um, so that's one way to do it, to do this right click, uh, create new view for output. Um, another thing that uh, Sylvan Corley recently did uh, was 
uh, to make a new widget called a sidecar widget. So in JupyterLab, we have these sidebars. There's a left sidebar. There's a right sidebar you can't see because nothing's in it. Um, but basically, you took an output widget. And instead of putting the output widget in the output area of a notebook, he said, threw it over to the sidebar. And so uh, as an example of this, Go back up here. Here's this I'm going to import from this new sidecar uh, widget. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating a sidecar. Yep. <coughs> oh. Is that better? Yep, yep. Okay. So I'm creating a sidecar and giving it a title. Let's do that in one cell. And what it did is pop it up or, or over here on the right sidebar. So this is very specific to the JupyterLab interface. And, uh, and this is an output widget. So anything I could do with output widgets, anything I can print or capture or errors or whatever appear now on the right-hand side. And I can clear the output. It's, it's, it's literally just an output widget that ends up appearing over on the right-hand side. And so let's see, I already ran that line. So I can make a, a slider, and I can display that slider, and it appears in the sidecar. So this is similar to that create a new view for the output and have a tab I can move around. Um, but it just throws it over there. I can create a new sidecar. Uh, sidecar output 2. And it just appears in a tab over here, so I can switch between the two outputs here. And uh, here's another one with another slider, et cetera. So again, this is a very nice, easy way. And it doesn't have to be sliders, right? I can, it's a normal output widget. So with SC print I, I could put any output I want down there. Let's see, that went to this one right here. So it's really an output widget. I can log errors. I can do whatever I want. And it throws it over to the sidebar. And then, of course, I can collapse the sidebar just by clicking on the tab there. OK, so this becomes really powerful, again, when I'm working with something like a map or an interactive widget, where I have some, some output that I want to keep on the screen uh, as I work through the notebook. And so for example, here, I'm going to create this map, put it over in the sidecar. Let's, delete, let's close some of these other sidecars by clicking on the Xs. There's my map. And notice the map actually resizes to be the full size of the sidecar. Um, and again, I can interact, and you see that it's changing the actual sidecar there. Clear the layers, add a layer. I can get information from the map. And if the person changes the map, I can get the new information, the new center, the new zoom, et cetera. OK, so now I'm going to show you some things that you can do with the uh, IPy leaflet, but in this nice uh, framework where I have this map over on the side. Um, so I create a marker. I can change the interact. I can change the opacity just by uh, programmatically changing the uh, mark dot opacity. Or IPy leaflet has a nice feature where uh, it's kind of like the interact feature in, in IPy widgets, where it can automatically make a GUI for any particular attribute. So here I'm making a GUI for the opacity attribute for this marker. I can make a pop up. So here's an HTML pop up. I'm going to add it to the add it to that particular mark. And now when I click on that mark. Got a nice, nice little pop-up. Um, I got a cluster, marker cluster. So if there's a ton of markers on the map, uh, if there's a ton of markers on the map, you know, if there's too many markers, it just gets overwhelming. And so if you zoom out a lot, it sort of combines markers into this sort of cluster object. And then I can click on the cluster object and it zooms in, lets me see the see the actual markers, and I can pull those off the map. Uh, let's see, I can overlay an image, IPython interactive computing. Uh, this is, I, th I think, essentially how the VEX works, where you overlay a heat map uh, for it. OK, here's a polyline. OK, so a polyline is a, uh, you know, just some drawing that I'm doing on the map. I can set the fill and opacity, et cetera. I can take it back off the map. So I can really sort of interactively work with this map programmatically work with this map. Notice here what I'm doing is I'm, I'm making a polygon uh, for the bounds of the current map. So then I can zoom out so I can see exactly what people are looking at and pull it off. Here's another example, a rectangle. Zoom out, you can see the rectangle was at the bounds of the map, a circle. Here again, I'm making an interact, uh, interactive control 
for this particular circle. So let's zoom back in. So there's my circle and I can change the weight, change the opacity, etc. You get the idea. And I can query stuff from that circle. There's a particular ID associated with the circle. I can pull it off. I can look, at, examine the map, see what kind of layers I have on the map. Uh, look at the circle, let's see, circle marker. So you do lots of, lots of marks on the map. I think you get that idea. You can do more than just programmatically put marks on the map though. Um, let's go to this example. All right, so let's pull this map off. And let's uh, get that side card code from over here. Okay, so here's my map. And here's my zoom level. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to, instead of programmatically add stuff to the map, I want to actually draw on the map. So I'm going to add a draw control. So you see I have it sort of standard polygons, lines, etc. And then uh, as I draw on this map, so man, I, you know, really want to you know, investigate this or I want to somehow interact with this. So there's a polygon. And now this DC thing, uh, this uh, draw control is a widget. And I can hear, you know, see, query what the last action was and I can actually get the coordinates of that drawing point. And I can listen to the drawing points as well. So if you want to trigger something, anytime somebody draws on the map, you get the coordinates and you can do all sorts of analysis, etc. You can clear uh, any sort of polygons or anything uh, that's on the map. You can draw, uh, you, can, you can synchronize the two things. So here I'm drawing whatever I drew on the one map. Now I'm creating a new map and putting that same polygon on this map, etc. So again, I have interactive controls uh, uh, for for uh, geographic information, and I'll show you one more. Uh, you do yes, question. Yes. Um, you're talking about your geographic control, so yeah. Is that like geodetically aware? Were you able to pick like good question? Longitude? Good question. I'm not sure, but we can find out. <laughs> we can find out. Um, as in. Can I pick a specific longitude and latitude here without just like eyeballing it? Yeah, without eyeballing it, because I'm um, thinking, you know, I have a bunch of roads, say, that I'm marking for a mine that could possibly be in North America. It's an open pit mine. And I want to examine some of the um, net operating hours that trucks may have when they're going across on a road, but I want to pick the path, mm -hmm. right? So can I actually pick the XY coordinates and match them to GPS coordinates that I may have stored? Yeah, good question. Since you can programmatically also uh, do things, you might be able to pick something and then translate that in Python, like do that calculation in Python and then programmatically put the, put the line or something that you want on the map. Like you have the full power of the, your Python libraries to be able to deal with this interaction. But good question. And, and let's, 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 let's hook you up with the people that understand the mapping part of this better than I do. To, to see what's possible. I'll just show one more because it's a pretty demo. Um, so this is adding a velocity map. So here I have a map. And let's go ahead and create a new view for this map so that we see it over to the side or maybe down below. All right, and I'm just gonna open up uh, a velocity field and woohoo. In fact, I'll replace my notebook with that because it's so beautiful. Yeah, so again, IPy widgets, I added a velocity map and, and, and I get to just stare at it mesmerized for a while. Um, so again, the emphasis here is, like when we say interactive controls and we talk about a framework for having user interaction automatically synced up to kernel side uh, state and actions running triggered based on state changes there and reflected back to the user interface. Like really 
you know, go wild and, and, you know, let your dreams come true as far as like any sort of interaction we're talking about here, not just sliders and text boxes or anything like that. Um, anything where it's interesting, you have an interesting user interface where you can interact, push those changes to Python automatically, do whatever computations you want triggered from those interactions and then push changes back uh, to be visualized on the browser side. Okay, questions? All right. What's next, Matt? Fine questions. Um, you to do the uh, embedding? Oh, yes. Right, so next is, what if you want to do this stuff outside of the notebook? And we've got you covered here. So during the transition, there are a couple of notebooks that you've seen up here that are not in the repository. They were stuff that we didn't know would be ready, if it would be ready to share or not. We will get those uploaded later this week. So. Um, <clears throat> so it basically comes uh, back to uh, the question uh, you had for the um, for rendering it, uh, rendering a notebook. Um, so there are actually two parts. So le let me go uh, get back to this uh, this plot that I showed you before. Actually, let me first do this. To make sure that we don't have two. So this is the same plot. So I have here the, uh, the vectors and the, uh, the sliders. And what you can do in a classical notebook, it's not yet in JupyterLab. You go to widgets, embed widgets, copy to clipboard. So that's, let me show this again. So this is an HTML snippet that contains the whole state of this, uh, of the widgets that you see. Copy that to clipboard, paste this into an HTML file, save it. Uh, so I had it here. No. And you have it here. So I showed you programmatically in iPy volume you can do this, but there are like uh, ways to do this um, um, this way as well in the classical notebook. And what you can also do if you do widgets, save notebook widget state. Now the widget state is embedded in the notebook. Which makes your notebooks really big, yeah. by the way. Um, so you can, well, I already did this. You upload this to, uh, um, say, GitHub. And adjust and which is this one. So you see, uh, GitHub doesn't render this for security reasons. So, but if you go to MB Viewer, and this is the URL of the notebook, you see that it renders the notebook in here. But this does not have a, a, a backend uh, connected to it. Um, so how do I show this? Yeah. So the example that I showed you with the map, with the taxi data. Um, so this is really short. What, what's important is that in the end you have a, a, a Python script and um, it has a variable called map, and that's the final widget that we're going to display. So you, if you use, um, let me increase the font size. No, that doesn't work. Uh, so if you install IPy widget server, this is the module name, and this is the uh, widget variable name. It starts up a, a special kind of uh, a Jupyter notebook-like server that has a, a special kernel that cannot execute arbitrary code, just that piece of code, and show you the uh, the widget. So you go to localhost. Uh, 
and hope that it works. Yeah. And now the example that we had in the notebook, you can have this in uh, on a real server that's that's uh, that's running, and you can like of course change the HTML, etc. So just to show that there are like ways to get get it out of the notebook. So there's another project that I started using uh, Flask. It's not as mature as this, but uh, if people are interested in that, uh, let me know. So a question there? Yeah. This one is I missed how you got the little specialized embedded Python thing, so could you tell us what you did? And the second question was on that. So you mean this? So this let me do uh, another example, import. Uh, float slider. So now you have a, let me close something, widgetserver.py, which is a Python module uh, that can be imported if you're in the same directory, widget underscore server. Oh. And now you run IPy widget server, the module name, which in this case is widget server, without the dot .py, and then slider. Yeah, some exception, apparently not so important. And then you can render any widget. And this widget can be an HBox or a VBox, it can be a whole uh, user interface. But now there's a connected kernel. So it's really, you can execute Python code, like basically what you have in a notebook, but without the whole notebook interface. And what's important is you cannot execute arbitrary code unless a special value of this will do rm minus uh, rf tilde uh, slash or something. But you really have to do like actively uh, uh, make it execute code. And uh, the, this kernel can't do that. So it's pretty safe. <coughs> yeah, not as a question. Jason? Um, anytime you're dealing with an authenticated system, you may have some issues with like arbitrary JavaScript stealing passwords, depending on where you're serving that JavaScript from and things. So it may be that your administrators put a hard line and say no. Um, but really, that's a question for your administrators and what their comfort level is with you know, whatever is available. So what, um, in IPy widgets itself, or Jupyter widgets, I should say, the, like the front-end code for, uh, uh, for all of this, there, as far as we know, there's no way to execute arbitrary code. So it's, it's, we don't do like eval and like people can like put something in the text box. So it should be pretty safe, but uh, yeah. Good. More questions? Yes? Is there any large difference of performance uh, depending on the web browser? Uh, Google Chrome, Firefox, etc. Because we, do you, use a, you use a lot of the JavaScript code. And uh, have you performed some uh, benchmark here? Well, I mean, <clears throat> it's really nice actually that there that there's quite some competition between browsers. So uh, I think they're they're really like everybody's trying to catch up with each other. And I think now Firefox has a lead. But I think that the main browsers are all like fine. I I didn't see, at least from the performance point of view, I didn't see any major uh, major issues. Maybe you have some more yeah. to say about this. More just anecdotal, like feeling more than any measured, <coughs> you know, speed difference. Um, I think, I mean, there are minimum browsers that we support. If we don't support IE nine, for example, or IE ten, I think IE eleven 
we support in the classic notebook, Jupyterlab doesn't support IE 11. So I mean, there's there's some minimal browser requirements, but I haven't noticed uh, any hard things that I've measured where I just said, man, this is really slow. I need to measure this. What about the mobile web developers? Yeah, uh, Chrome works. I, actually, everything that I, 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 so I usually use Chrome for development, and if I try it out on my phone, it's, I, I believe it's the same code base. So everything seems to work, yeah. At least on, on Android with Chrome, yeah. So about the uh, dashboarding, so there is, ah, that's Thursday. Really? Yeah. This time? Okay. Um, there's a birds of feather session on dashboarding, so if you're interested in that, want to like brainstorm, uh, feel free to join. Yes. Um, um, I don't like um, see like um, um, so um, so action. Um, are they like hard to do in um, Wi-Fi widgets? Cross filter. Do you cross filter? Like, um, 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 cross filter um, is when like um, your like um, uh, like um, interactions and like um, one charge um, change that like um, uh, like um. Another chart, and also like um, when I uh, program in like um, JavaScript, I can like um, select um, the individual pieces um, relatively um, easily. Um, like, and I like wanted to. Do those uh, like uh, same things in uh, Python, but I'm not seeing a lot of examples that kind of like show how you get um, uh, like um, the, the, the interaction from the uh, like um, HTML back to the Python. So. So the question was about uh, like uh, filtering, and, and if I understand it correctly, so you have a plot, you do some selection here, and how to show that. So um, I think there's some work to be done on this. Um, so let me show, I hope this works. Um, so, uh, does this work? Yeah, so in iPad volume you can do like selections. So now it selected these. Um, and so let me show you. So that give, actually gives you an array of the indices. Well, it's actually a double array. There's a bug. This is my development uh, uh, version. Um, but you can link this. So let me continue. So now I have the same, so I have a 2D plot and a 3D plot with the same data. Okay. I didn't import this. I did this here for some reason. Um, and you can link, uh, here I do a D-link, which is a directional link. So anything that's uh, my selected uh, in the scatter 3D, get synced to the scatter, uh, the 2D scatter selected. This one, uh, so in the D-link, you also have a transform method that takes like this data set. You can, that's the advantage of the uh, doing the linking also on the uh, front end is that you can do a calculation with it. So you can do some transformation. So I convert it to a list because BQplot actually wants it to be a, a, a list in this case. And now I can do selections. 
and these are synchronized between the uh, uh, the two. So I think there are, there's more work. There, this I think this needs to be. Um, we need to define like how to do this also on the front end, so it can all be done in the front end. So once you have, like save this to a static HTML on your tablet, you can do selections, and it works on the. It doesn't have to go through a front end. And we also need to define okay, like a hovering picking. So if I click on a particular value, I also want to show it. And if I hover over a particular point, I also want to see it in all the other plots. And also Plotly just re recently, I, I'm not sure if they converted, but they they at least embraced widgets. And uh, they probably have their own way uh, as well. They put some energy into defining how to do this. And it would be nice if all the libraries would like have some common API or, or format to uh, communicate this in the front end. So uh, yeah, there's some work to be done on this, but, but it's already possible now. Yeah, uh, There's Jason. A couple of answers to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you the Mike Glassfinger answer. <laughs> okay. I assume you were going to talk about like, events. I mean, it should be something in BQ plot itself. It shouldn't be. Yeah, there is there is a hover. There is a hover. Uh, I think there's a hover handler in BQ plot. I didn't show you. Is this on? Okay. Um, we didn't show you the uh, example in IPy leaflet that lets you catch the coordinates that the mouse is hovering over and you can react to those like in real time. They're sent back to the back end. Um, and IPy events is your escape hatch. <laughs> Should we advertise this or not? <laughs> I don't know. So, Matt, so in January, Matt and another person called Kaya, uh, named Kaya uh, uh, decided that they wanted the full JavaScript interaction paradigm, all JavaScript events uh, available, kind of like you know we let you set classes and then you could push whatever JavaScript or CSS you went over. So Matt and Kaya uh, made a widget that lets you uh, register a handler for any JavaScript event, including including hover, right? Uh, well, we don't cover hover. It's Oh, mouse, mouse events. Move. Okay, yeah. mouse move events. That's why I don't know that mouse move is in BQ plot, though. You can hover over something in BQ plot and have it change. Okay. And, and I think you get that value in the back end. So it's certainly possible, right? Any interaction paradigm you have in the front end, you could push to the back end. The question is, you know, how much do you want to push to the back end? How useful is it to push to the back end and stuff? And some libraries let you do that, like IPy leaflet, I'm pretty sure BQ plot. And I think Matt's widget essentially allows you to tap into the mouse events over anything, over any widget. Following on from that, is it possible to get like mouse and keyboard events from like without hovering over a specific widget? Like if you wanted to change the widget that was focused based on keyboard events? Okay, Matt's going to show you his <laughs> his escape hatch here. So it's not clear this is actually a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that's the big thing. But I will say, you have problems with the browser and key events and focus, right? The browser won't. You, you have to you have to worry about focus issues when you're dealing with key events and and, and events in general in the browser. So so I mean, we're limited by whatever the browser allows, obviously. Do you have an example, Matt? Why, you know, just in case this happened, I made sure to load up this page, and I'll, I'll upload this later. Uh, let me. Um, right, so this so was originally written for the purpose of being able to mouse over an astronomical image, zoom in and out of it, get um, pixel locations off and transform those into positions on the sky um, and that kind of thing. It hasn't worked out so well yet. But um, so I, I made an widget, widget called the event widget. And the event widget can watch for DOM events or browser events on 
another widget. So in this example, I've got a label that you will be able to interact with by clicking or pushing a key down or when the mouse enters the widget space. And I've got a HTML widget to display the event info. So if I mouse, oh, this is awkward. That's not working. Oh, I didn't, I didn't include, I didn't install the lab extension. Let me flip it to classical. There we go. So when I click, um, I just grabbed all of, all of the events that the browser normally returns, or all of the attributes that the browser normally returns, get returned as a Python dictionary back to Python. Um, you get different information for key presses than you do for mouse events. It doesn't make any sense to have a pixel location for a mouse event, for example. Uh, yeah, keyboard event, rather. Um, if you add a new view, then if I press a key in that view, I get the event sent back to my widget and you, and you update the value. Um, you can get a list of the available events. <laughs> Turns out, um, for a mouse event, uh, there are several different versions of coordinates that can be returned. Um, I don't honestly understand all of them. We put them in anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they were there. <laughs> Why not return them? It was harder to take them out. Um, I've, I've got a link to, to information about them. You do need to be careful with this sort of stuff. So you'd think, OK, I want to catch a double click event. A double click event is a series of several events in the browser. So you have to be a little bit careful what you're watching for, because if you're watching for clicks and double clicks, you're going to get two click events and a double click for every double click. Um, da -da -da. Yeah, see, there's some explanation of what the different uh, types are. So this is the one that really drives people crazy. You can turn off default interactions. So for example, let me go back up here. So one of the keyboard shortcuts in a Jupyter notebook, I'll just overwrite it, is that if I push the A button, it gives me a new cell. Not anymore, if you're over the widget, it doesn't do that. So that I felt that was necessary because you don't want to accidentally push DD over your, over your widget that you're interacting with it with and have it disappear because the notebook interpreted that keyboard uh, keyboard shortcut. Um, you can turn off some of the context menu stuff, at least in classic notebook and Jupyter Lab, it doesn't work. But um, and the hmm? oh. All right, well maybe what time is it? It's about 525 anyway, so. so I well, it's 520. It so we, we, we wanted to make sure we leave some time at the end for whatever questions you have, or if you want to play with any of the stuff you've seen in the last hour for, for in the next 10 minutes and ask us questions. You, you get to the point with this where it, the question is whether it's easier just to write the JavaScript and write a new widget and write the JavaScript to do what you want and, and package that up versus trying to push all of your code from JavaScript over to Python to handle all of your interaction. Yeah, yeah if it's simple interactions, like you want to be able to click on an image or, or you know, click on some widget in your interface and have something happen, you do that, this is useful. It, it's turning out not to be that useful for an Im image browser if you're doing all of the calculation on Python and have to keep pushing images back and forth. Other questions? Yep. Uh, is there any updates coming or plans for some rest widgets? Yeah. <laughs> You've got the there, mic. Okay, so what? Oh. Okay, so there are updates coming. Uh, iPad widget 7.3 is, we held off on releasing it because we didn't want to like destabilize everything for this week. So 
Uh, 7.3 is in pre-release right now, and the, one of the big things it has is a grid box uh, control to lay things out in a grid. Um, and, but you asked about something specific. Asynchronous widgets. Asynchronous widgets. What do you mean by asynchronous so widgets? Like if I have a long-running simulation or something, and I want to have a widget that can interact with, so right now it seems like the best way is to have a separate thread that just kind of manually adjusts values and things like that. Is that, we're just, is that how it's going to be going forward? So you can... There's various strategies for handling uh, separate threads and widgets. There's uh, a notebook in the documentation for uh, some patterns for handling separate threads uh, with widgets. Um, we're in a sense fighting some issues with the, with the notebook itself and dealing with threading and output and things like that, but, but those are uh, uh, avoidable. We can overcome come some of the issues that we're fighting with there. Um, but you should be able to do some, at least some of what you're thinking of right now. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to yeah. do the full right. aspect. But I, we can, my guess is we can do what you're describing right now um, and, and check out the documentation for the asynchronous widgets uh, uh, documentation page. Everything's thread safe, right? Everything's thread safe, so you can change uh, trades from any thread, right? It's thread safe because we have a global interpreter lock in Python, so everything's thread safe there. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. We're, yes, we're pure Python, so we're good. Uh, none particularly, but we're interested in having conversations with whoever wants to talk to us about it. More questions? It looks like you've got something working. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I copied the image file over, so you click and you get um, the mouse coordinates of the click event back, you can also get, I need to click again, get those back as properties and it's possible to monitor the mouse, let me see if I have it open, no I don't. Um, you can also monitor the mouse position and return that as you, as you move also, so. So I think, just to wrap up, um, we have the Birds of Feather uh, session on Thursday for dashboarding and web apps. We have several talks uh, dealing with widgets, like Martin uh, pointed out his talk on Friday. There's several other talks about widgets uh, that you're more than welcome to come to. We'll be around during the conference if you want to stop by and chat about widgets. Uh, and another great time to get together is JupyterCon. Uh, JupyterCon's August 21st through 25th. Uh, in New York City, and a lot of Jupiter people will be there. And uh, there's sprints this weekend if you want to work on widgets or you want to work on some project, you know, based on widgets or whatever, or work on your own projects. And are you guys, either of you going to be there? So Matt will be here for the sprints. Um, so is there anything else to? So we'll be, we don't officially end till 5.30, we'll be here, oh sorry, we don't officially end till 5.30, we'll be here till 5.30, but rather than trying to cram three more examples into, the, into your brain in the next seven minutes, we'll just stop now, mm -hmm. and if you want to play around with stuff and ask questions, we're here. And if you want to ask when is dinner, like that's a great question, <laughs> we can go, or whatever, yeah. Okay. All right, great, enjoy the conference. Thank you.